And good afternoon. Welcome to the webinar, Creating Engaging Mathematics Instructional Videos. I have our special guest and friend, Dennis Sheeran on today. Welcome, Dennis. Hey, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to kind of just talk about what we've been doing now that we're in a, a more uh, virtual space. Yeah, you know, we have been doing a week long series of webinars this week. You know, Tuesday we did a, a webinar on creating instructional, engaging literacy videos with Dr. Kenneth Kunz. And then yesterday we had an amazing panel of eight leaders to share their perspectives on leading through remote learning. And then so today you kind of uh, round us out for the week talking about mathematics. And you and I are, are both um, into math. Uh, I was gonna call us math nerds, but I'll just speak for myself. Uh, <laughs> I'm a bit of a math nerd. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to uh, learning from you today about how to make successful and engaging instructional videos. I will go over kind of the, the flow of today with all of our listeners. We have uh, 300 people here today, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. If you have a question um, for myself or Dennis, you know, feel free to ask a question. The best way to ask a question is the ask a question button at the bottom of your screen. And the reason why that's the best place to ask is that people can go in and vote for your question. And the more votes you have, the more that your, your question actually will go up to the top. And in that way, we have open Q&A. Uh, we'll be able to go in order of those questions that get the most votes. So um, if you like a question, go in there and vote for it. And that way, there's a better chance of the question being answered. And we'll go for about an hour today. And Dennis, go ahead and kind of uh, kick us off and share a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, you know, thanks for, again, giving me the opportunity to be here. So for those of you who are already connected with me on Twitter or Instagram or out in the internet world, uh, thank you. I love that we've been connected. Again, you can see on there at the bottom right, you can find me on Twitter at MathDennisNJ, or you can visit my website, DennisSheeran.com, where I have blogs about math teaching, regular teaching, leadership. Um, you know, there's, there's two types of teaching, math teaching and regular teaching, but, um, and uh, follow my YouTube channel for some more math videos that I've just started putting up there. Uh, I'm the author of two books, Instant Relevance, Using Today's Experiences to Teach Tomorrow's Lessons, which was published by Dave Burgess Consulting. He's the author of Teach Like a Pirate, and Hacking Mathematics, 10 Problems That Need Solving, which uh, is published by Times 10 and Mark Barnes Publications. So, but a little bit about me. I started teaching high school math in 1999, uh, in Illinois. So I think I saw some of you from Illinois. I saw a Catholic school teacher out there in the Chicagoland area. I taught at yes. Lake Forest High School in the north suburbs. And uh, then I moved back to New Jersey eight or nine years ago and became a district administrator, uh, supervising math departments from pre-K to 12 and really learning so much more about the full scope of what's going on in math education outside of my high school math classroom. And now as I'm engaged in my doctoral program in curriculum and instruction, uh, really at the moment studying the effect of Desmos on learning. Um, I am the senior math consultant for, Rus for Rutgers University's Center for Effective School Practices. So uh, that's where you can connect with me right there. I hope that I uh, see a bunch of new people following on Twitter and on the YouTube channel, and I'd love to follow you right back so that we can stay connected right now. Uh, and really, uh, it's just a great opportunity for us in this world to grow together and to learn together. And so I really encourage all sorts of connection, even from just a let's say hi and share ideas all the way through building some new new things together. Absolutely. So today, uh, like Nate mentioned, we're gonna do a couple of things. And first is to explore some of those essential elements of a math video, video mini lesson. And for some of you, if you're in the secondary world, you might not have heard the phrase mini lesson much, but it's about time that you did. Uh, and then Nate's really gonna take us deeper into creating an instructional video with, with WeVideo and some of the amazing things that they're doing there and the platform that is available to you as a teacher. So getting started here, I really want you to think about a couple things. And it's what you really experienced in your classroom. First is that students learn math by doing math. When we just tell kids math, uh, we hope that they remember it. We repeat ourselves a hundred times and then some of them give it back to us, but that's not really how they learn it and experience it. And it's not how they figure it out uh, by listening. So we want them to be doing math in our videos. And your voice isn't the only voice on the internet. Like you know that you've done a really great lecture and you found somebody else doing virtually the same thing on YouTube. So use those resource resources that are available to accentuate and support your voice while you're there. Um, and let's find ways to prepare students to engage with our video in our video. Like, is there a way that we can get engagement going while they're involved from just thinking all the way through interaction? 
And I think really, Dennis, it's important. I love how you talked about, you know, do students engaging with the math and how that's different than just doing tons and tons of repetition and practice problems. Because I think most math teachers would agree that students do learn um, by engaging with the math at a deeper level, but that doesn't mean a slew of, of math problems <laughs> on worksheets. So, uh, right. which is why we're talking today about like, how do we go to that next level? How do we get really engaging, making math meaningful? And I just had a great conversation yesterday with Pam Harris, if anybody was connected with her on Twitter too. Her website is mathisfigureoutable.com. <laughs> and her whole goal is to be able to have our students leave her math classrooms, even through high school and college classrooms, not really knowing or having to force themselves to know an algorithm for a process. Just that they can go into any situation and know they can figure it out. And it's a really important point. And at that point here, we can use our videos to inspire the motivation to figure out math as well. So um, when we decide to design a video for a classroom, um, the first point that I have on here is that you really want your instructional video to deliver your main point, not your first classroom experience. Take that uh, really for what it means. When a student walks, walks in your classroom, whether it's a 40 minute or a 60 or a 90 minute class, uh, you have a broad experience for them. In fact, as a district administrator, I changed my teacher's lesson plan files. And I said, I don't want these called lesson plans. I want you to call them student experiences. And that way they were always thinking about what their, te what their classroom was gonna be like from a student's perspective. Yeah. And when you think about that experience, it's are they gonna come and sit and listen to me for 45 minutes? <laughs> well, first of all, I don't wanna recreate that in an instructional video. Second, like if I can have a highly interactive environment where I have small groups and quick interactive responses and maybe a, whole, a couple of games and independent stations, that's really hard to recreate in a video too. So our classroom experience was when we were in charge of our students in person. So we really wanna make sure that our main point gets delivered to our students. Uh, how you deliver that is up to you. Yeah. Um, and then focus on those skills and concepts and how you want to engage with them. Is this something that we want our students to be introduced to, to practice or to apply? And what does that mean for how you're gonna pr produce your video? Uh, and for the love of all that is holy, be yourself. You know, Just have some fun uh, for your own sanity and for your kids. They wanna see you, you wanna see yourself having fun. It's an, it's an excellent opportunity to support a social emotional learning environment where your students can say, I'm comfortable here and my teacher is comfortable here. And Dennis, you know, I have to yeah. say that you are really good about making your videos fun, funny, and personable uh, because you know just looking at the video you created for this project and your next instructional video, uh, you know there were definitely some movie scenes. There were like you know you would put the camera really close to you. You would be funny, and uh, students love that. They they love when uh, we kind of break out of that um, kind of robotic shell and just get real fun and funny with them. So uh, I'm here to say and to, to back up that point for sure. And you do a wonderful job with that. Oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> so all the more reason for you guys to jump back and follow that YouTube channel that I'm starting up. But yeah. that, that being said, really consider this. Um, you've all had a need to learn something. For me, I know I had to fix my my uh, clothes dryer the other day because it wouldn't start and I had to order a part and replace it. So I went to YouTube to find out how. And when I looked up how to fix that part of my clothes dryer, there was like 40 videos on how to do the same one thing. And what one did I pick? The shortest one. <laughs> and I actually it was the second one that I picked that was right around the same, the same length as the first one that was really the shortest. I picked the second shortest one because the first shortest one was literally the Bueller guy on the left side of the screen. I couldn't listen to his <laughs> voice. Like I can't learn anything from this guy. Keep it in mind. Make your videos interactive if possible, short and sweet and fun, Give exam introduce, give an example, summarize, assign, get them off the video. But you don't have to, uh, you don't have to make this too long. The research really shows that our students' attention span and even our adult attention span, this isn't something that's new about kids these days, is like, they can really focus on you for about six minutes before their attention drops off. Yeah. And it really peaks the drop off after nine minutes. Yeah. So if you're not, if you're gonna make it longer than nine minutes long, you'd better do kind of what I mentioned, what Nate just mentioned I did, break it up, regain yeah. their attention, break it up in pieces that you're going from one atmosphere to another, or you've got a quick funny thing in between to keep them re-engaged, but definitely don't make this your 45 minute classroom yeah. and then sit down and feel like, I'm so glad they came, you know? Absolutely. So to me, there's a few essential elements of a good instructional video. And when those elements come together, poof, flame, you know, I mean, in a good way this time. 
but uh, and that would be chunking, planning, recording, enhancing, and ending. And uh, I'm going to go through each one of those with you right now in a way that I think is kind of uh, a little bit self-explanatory. And keep that in mind that this is from a, an instructional video point of view, not uh, a new classroom practices point of view, because these things mean a little bit different in a classroom practice setting. So when it comes to chunking, I want you to keep that time element involved. I really want you to remember time is important and too much time is not your friend. So you don't want to spend a lot of time on something. So you think about what I want to deliver to my students and break it into chunks. So for mine, I thought uh, I was doing a quick lesson on multiplying two fractions together. I knew my students would have come from having multiplied a fraction times a whole number and a fraction times a unit fraction, which is a fraction with a numerator of one. And so I stood outside my house, made a quick introduction video of me saying, I know we've done this and this and this, and now we're going to get to the next one. Are you ready? And so that was me. Then that transitioned into an introduction scene of the lesson objective title, turning into the first set of me narrating over my slides that I prepared. So when you think about the parts of your lesson, what are they? Are it you introducing yourself, then introducing the lesson? Are you going to warm up the students? Are you going to go back and forth with different components of what you want? Are you going to be doing handwriting and then show some slides? Are you going to take them to an activity or another website? What are the chunks that you need? And then keep those in mind as you prepare the organization, the order, and the time that you want to give each one. And do it with intention, as you can see there, and with interaction in mind. Do I want my students to interact? How do I want them to think about this? If I want my students to think creatively about this situation, I had better prepare them to think creatively right before that. So uh, here's an example of that. I like to warm my students up for class, and I have a whole uh, professional development session that I do called going from do now to think now. Because the traditional do now is a lost opportunity. It's time where we're walking around taking, you know, checking attendance and checking homework while our kids are doing a problem that looks like yesterday's homework. And if they didn't know yesterday's homework, then they don't know this one. And if they did know yesterday's homework, then they don't need this one. And if they're kind of in the middle, they're gonna ask a question anyway. So it's really just a waste of time. I prefer to think about getting them into a think now format. So here's an example of where I might be presenting a new topic to students and I want them to be doing some comparison and uh, generating their own ideas about this topic. So what you see in front of you is something called a which one doesn't belong. And if you've never seen these before, there are a lot available to you at wodb.ca. And you ask your students, hey, take 30, 15 seconds and figure out which one of these doesn't belong and a reason why. And then you turn them to their partners and say, or their table groups or whatever you have and say, all right, tell them and tell them why. So the low hanging fruit on this one is that the kids will pick Mitsubishi in the bottom right because it's red, you know, but another student might have picked it because it's two dimensional and another might have picked it because it has no curves. Um, and then someone might pick the one that looks like an H because it has, an le has a letter and another student might pick the one with an H that's Honda because it's the only one, uh, I don't know which one I was going to look at. Yeah, it's, it's a, it doesn't have like a central symmetry to it, like a center point. Kids think about the Mercedes one as the only one that's not made in Germany. And I have all these creative and fun ideas. But what you're really doing is saying, look at a situation, identify important characteristics, discuss them clearly with your partners and learn from each other. And if that's what I want my kids to do in the next part of my lesson or my video, then I had better prepare them for that. So even in a video, I can give students this and say, think about which one doesn't belong and why. There are mechanisms I'm going to show you a little bit later that you could actually have students respond to that so you could see their response. But if you at least get them thinking about it, then you've prepared them for the next element. And that's how you can effectively use a chunk of time to get them ready for the next component of your lesson. I think this is a great example, Dennis, of whenever we want our students to begin a lesson and you know warm up a bit. And many times we think we need to go to the the, the drills and, you know, having students do these, these speed drills where they're trying to do these algorithms, uh, you know, 20 of them in, you know, 20 seconds. Um, and what I love about this, with this kind of inter intentional cognitive warm-ups is that you're getting the brain to think critically. We're thinking, we're identifying patterns, we're comparing and contrasting. So we're warming our brain up in a different way, I think in a deeper way, and we're, we're really preparing ourselves for a more engaging and meaningful lesson. So I think this is really a real, the best and kind of effective way to start a math lesson. Um, def definitely juxtaposed to, <laughs> to the, uh, the drill and kill is just, uh, so much better, so much more meaningful. Right, and it's uh, 
it's amazing when you see the effect in a classroom. Uh, you've all, if you're a math teacher, which you should all be at least, um, you've seen kids, you know, about 15 minutes into your class and your lesson, all of a sudden you're, they're like, you're like, oh, hey, you're with me now. You guys, you know, you're caught up. I guess you're, they could have been with you from the start. You just didn't choose to warm them up the right way. And as a track yeah. coach for 12 years, um, I knew how to warm up my athletes. And if I was running up distance runners or sprinters, I'd have to warm them up differently. So this is a great way to warm kids up for that thinking process. But if what you're about to present to them is quick recall, then you've got to find a way to warm them up for quick recall. But the, your brain does different things. And the cognitive research on this shows that when you are explaining, coaching, and describing like this, you're activating anywhere between six to 10 times as many synapses firing, which takes that brain and then says, they're all available for the next thing I'm going to do. So obviously you can tell I'm passionate about that and how it starts, but that's why I chose this chunk as an example. You can keep this in your video lesson. You might not see yeah. that your students are engaged in thinking the way you want them to think, but by putting it out there, you can hope and expect that more of them will be than they would have been had you just started right in, okay? Absolutely, or we can even ask our students to create their own, which one doesn't belong, and then create a video of, of that. So, I mean, there's so many things we can do to see how they engage with the concept. Nate, now you're jumping back into my next PD session. <laughs> it's good, so right? Right, which is authentic assessment of student learning. And when they're creating their own, or they're really, I give them one with three blocks filled in as they make the fourth, then they've got to under, show me that they fully understand the characteristics of the first three to be able to put in a fourth one that kind of fits, but also doesn't kind of fit. Now, so now let's say that for another webinar though. Um, yeah. But uh, in planning your video, uh, Obviously, you've all seen uh, the text example there. Guys, uh, build video-ready slides and materials that you're going to use, okay? Which means using good visuals and minimum text. A majority of the text on this screen is intentionally text you're not supposed to read. So I, I'm okay with that. But the more text you have out there, or the more you try to display a slightly far away version of your math worksheet, the worse it's gonna be. So let your voice, your descriptions, enhance the visual that you have and allow for the students to really think about what you're saying and showing. And that way, if there's a minimum visual and you have an arrow that you pointed over to something that's important, that's the thing that's gonna draw their attention. It's not gonna be covered up with all the fluff of the other stuff on the screen. Um, yeah. And don't overdo it, again, it's better to have a few small videos to teach kids with something than it is to have one big one. Because you know, I mean, I don't know if you have kids or not. I have four. I have a sophomore, an eighth grader, a third grader, and a first grader. And my first and third grader are getting stuff from their teachers all the time, and they love it. But when they open up a video from their teacher that's a math description or it's uh, they're, they're reading a book and has some instructions on what to do, if they see a video that's longer than seven or eight minutes long, they're like, oh, 13 minutes. I'm like, dude, you don't have to go to school for six hours. Give them 13 minutes. But even that, like, they know. They would rather see three, four and a half minute videos in a row that they have to watch and be happy to do it. So plan that and think, is this better as a singular moment uh, that I can make short? Or do I really need to keep these as a, a bigger chunk? Uh, and then use what you've got. You know you've got great lessons and great materials, and I trust and hope that you do. Um, but use those and enhance those as part of your production when you think about making an instructional video. Don't go digging around teachers pay teachers for new stuff to work on. Don't go digging around other places. Your expertise and your preparation really need to stay in play here. And that's what your kids want to see. Your thing, your style, your whatever. You don't have to open up a Bitmoji classroom and start links if you don't want to. You can, no problem with that. But Again, if that's who you are and who you are is the, your, the be yourself moment is to always try new things and your kids are on board with it. But if who you are is a, a personality that they've come to know, love and expect, be that personality and give them those loving and known and expected activities. Absolutely. Um, sorry, am I drying out here? I talked to you. Listen, I'm doing the one thing guys that I want to tell you. The fact is this is a webinar and uh, you're not in the room with me, although I wish I could be in the room with all of you talking about this right now. I'm talking way more than I would do in a classroom. <laughs> so got some tea ready and ready to go here. But now think about uh, your recording and your presenting. I don't know what your technology situation is like. You might have your smartphone, you might have a Chromebook, you might have a PC, a Mac, a video camera, whatever else you want to do. Um, but there's two real things that make for a basic instructional video that you want to have. And the first is screen capturing. Yeah. So 
There are a multiple platforms for screen capture and WeVideo has an excellent way for you to screen capture and bring it right into its production format. Um, but when you do that, speak clearly. First of all, I just saw um, a, my son's phys ed teacher uh, doing a presentation on bike safety. And so uh, I saw, um, I heard his voice from 15 feet away from the camera, right? We had to listen pretty carefully and turn the volume all the way up. So if you're gonna be involved in screen capturing, speak clearly. You don't have to speak too loudly, but speak well. Um, I have a set of headphones that just has a little microphone on it. You don't have to do anything other than that. Your computer probably has a nice recording uh, microphone on it as well. And if you're only using your recording mic, get a little closer, okay? Here we go. And, and Dennis, just to throw in there the uh, a really a wonderful feature in WeVideo is that the audio you can actually magnetize up to or, or uh, amplify up to 400%. So um, if you get video, so I'm taking video outside. I saw a video of you, Dennis, outside in your driveway and you know we can get far from our phone and have no worries when we put it into the WeVideo platform. I can show how to adjust the audio today. So that's anyway. excellent. Cause I yeah. wasn't even know that one. I'm happy to yeah. see that when you do yeah. it. <laughs> I'm here to learn too, everybody. There you um, go. And be concise. Uh, we ramble. We're teachers. We love our ideas. We love our content. We we're, we're passionate about the world around us, and because of that, we ramble. You know, we're like I, I I used to joke about how my pastor would always say that he had three points to a sermon, and each one of them had seven sub points. So, <laughs> like, be concise. Make your point, and then jump to the last bullet. There, repeat it. We know we repeat it, and we know repetition helps ideas sink in but a concise statement that's repeated is better than one that's over-explained. Um, and when you're screen capturing, again, no small text. Don't keep your stuff far away. Learn how to zoom in or learn how to take a screenshot of something and paste it into a slides presentation so it can be seen easier. And then I like this one that I've used a lot, no loitering. Don't just sit for a majority of your time on one screen like I'm doing right now. <laughs> Otherwise, like literally people are like, oh, I'll just listen from afar, I don't have to look at this. Um, I'm not doing a lot of action here to show you these as they appear because I want you to be able to write, gather whatever you need from this video and see it all at once. But don't loiter on one scene. And then when you're recording yourself, there's a lot of platforms for that. WeVideo has an excellent embedded uh, webcam. It's got great uh, resolution to it. And then again, it's once right in the program. You've probably been using one of 20 others available out there for yourself as well. But when you record yourself, you're an actor now. And I always felt like I was an actor in my classroom, putting on five improv shows a day with a general skeleton outline of, of the script. Because when the kids walk in the room, your audience directs how you're gonna go. But you don't have an audience now. So you've gotta act like they're there, be exciting, be fun, add some mystery, make them wonder, make them want to see the next part of your video, give them some cliffhangers. And for God's sake, wear clothes. Uh, we've seen too many videos of people doing videos without pants on, but that's not really what I'm saying. What I meant by this is, uh, your clothes can be a distraction. If you're sitting in front of a bright, uh, a, like, uh, a bright background and you have checkered shirts and you have all the things or whatever, like, like think about what you're wearing when you're on the screen so that your clothes and your presentation of you aren't a distraction, okay? You're an actor now, but make the video about the instructional presentation and less about uh, how you're acting and presenting yourself. Dennis, what would you say if a teacher is maybe a little bit apprehensive of recording themselves, especially if teachers are new to creating instructional videos, um, maybe they don't love the camera. I feel like we're getting more and more used to that because we're doing more Zoom meetings and, and more Google Meets and synchronous uh, one-on-ones. Mm -hmm. But and, and then now we're doing more instructional videos as well asynchronously. But what would you say to teachers who might be a little bit nervous about it? Well, well, first to assuage the nerves, if it's possible, is you walked in front of your kids every day and yeah. you were, and they saw you and they didn't judge you and they loved you then. You're just yeah. gonna walk in front of them now every day. Sure, their parents might be in the background and they might judge you, but whatever, they're their parents and it doesn't matter. <laughs> Keeping that in mind, however, there's no real problem with giving your kids your voice at first. Yeah. Get them used to a video of just listening to you. But the yeah. less they see you in that, the more you're gonna want to integrate uh, those transitions that are exciting, those clips of other pieces of what you wanna do that break up the flow of the video a little bit more because without your face there, they don't have anything else to look at but the screen. Um, and a lot of the programs that you're using, and WeVideo does this as well, 
Um, when you get your webcam minimized in the corner, you know, when you're smaller, it's tough to see us. It's tough <laughs> to see our flaws. It's tough to see the background. It's tough to see my kid interrupting me and I didn't feel like re-recording. So that, you know, minimize yourself as the next step up and take those baby steps forward to get in front of everybody. You don't have to get a green screen, a camera hook up, set up and get yourself putting on a daily show for everybody. Good points, thank you. <laughs> um, so the next section that I mentioned was enhancing your instructional video. This is kind of phase two, okay? Now, if you've made a good instructional video where you've introduced what's going to go on, you've warmed up your kids, you've given them the instruction that you wanted to have, and maybe you left them with a question or something that they need to respond to, you're in a really great place. But a lot of you are using other apps and websites like Desmos and GeoGebra and Edpuzzle and PlayPos, where Desmos and GeoGebra are places where kids are doing highly valuable integrated math activities. I use Desmos almost exclusively and getting to know GeoGebra a little bit more. But on the Desmos Activity Builder, you can build an activity or find an activity for students that is introductory to a lesson, that helps them practice, that they can use as an application or even an assessment. And the interactive grapher and the Activity Builder can make for an online experience that's virtually impossible to recreate by a static instructional video. So how would you be able to integrate that into your video? So for me, I use it sometimes by giving my best instructional video and then launching them into Desmos because the instruction prepared them for a great activity. Other times, if I'm using something like Edpuzzle, I'm allowed to pause my video at a particular point and ask a question. I can pause my video and send kids out to another application and then back to talk about what they did. PlayPosit is another one like Edpuzzle that allows you to ask questions, get responses, share those responses, and keep going with the lesson when you do. So if you felt like you had a, uh, an instructional video that you're ready for the kids to do, and it would have been great to find out what they were thinking somewhere in the middle. This is the perfect spot for a question, a quick feedback point to see if they know what's going on. And if not, I can make them go back and watch this video again. Then now is the time for you to say, where can I do that? Edpuzzle, PlayPosit, they're great expl exploration places for you to use your videos. Just upload them from Wii Videos, download straight in. And you now have your video in a platform that's incorporating questioning and feedback. So uh, that's a something for a different day, but I encourage you to look into those platforms if you feel like you're ready to expand into not just giving information and value and explanation to your kids, but starting to get it back from them. Uh, that's where you can see some of that coming back. And I would say um, before you enhance your lesson or your instructional video, get it done, you know, <laughs> try it out, see what you can make and see what you're happy with and then say, is there space for enhancement in this process? You know, um, and then how do you end your lessons, right? When I'm giving a lesson, I could end it in any one particular way anyway. The bell could ring and I could say, oh shoot, I didn't finish, <laughs> get out of here. But for the most part, I summarize what we've done. So maybe in my video, I want to make sure I give my kids a summary of what we've done, that final, complete, clear repetition of my statement of my purpose for that day. Or maybe that's the assignment to the kids. I vote now add onto my video a link to a Google form and they can give me a response with their summary. Um, one of the prompts I like to use because it's pretty open-ended um, and I can say, a, and I can insert a clause in there, something like I used to think blank about graphing lines, but now I think blank. Saying I used to think this, but now I think this shows I picked up this skill. I learned this idea. I get this part of the concept. And you can see what your kids are thinking when they respond with a summary prompt like that. Or you could take your end, like I mentioned before, and say, guys, this is the end of it. Hopefully you pick this up. If not, go back over the video and pick up my ideas and listen again, and then get out of here and go to your next challenge. I've got this ready for you. Um, but make sure you bring a clear ending to it, not just your music role and your credits saying, you know, thanks to WeVideo for helping me make this video. Um, but bring it all together. Definitely take an opportunity to give your kids the chance to continue from there once the video is over. Just like your initial instruction, it should be the beginning of their, of their motivated learning, their chance to figure out, their chance to apply and understand. Your video shouldn't be the end of it. Yeah, and I think most educators would agree that that closure, that ending is really one of the most 
important parts of a lesson. It's truly where the students have the opportunity to own the learning. We hope that they're owning the learning all the way through, but it definitely is that part of the lesson where the students make the high level application. And so we have to make sure that's really a central part of the video. So I'm glad that you made a big, um, a big kind of uh, splash about that part of the lesson. Now, math teachers in the room, how different is this from really good instructional planning for your classroom? Well, it's not that different. It's just that the meat of this is not your voice talking, interacting with the kids when you're on the other side of a video. Yeah. So really think about the high quality lessons that you make and the reasons why you make them and the purpose for each component of those lessons and make sure that they become a component of your instructional video. Just make it shorter, make it sweeter, make it a little bit more interesting than, you, than the wait time might have been for you um, and keep that opportunity for kids to enhance and bring back to you on the table. So remember, here's some final thoughts. Why was I making this video anyway? Like, what's my purpose for this video? And if you realize your purpose was, like I said, introduction, practice, restatement, application, assessment, make sure you follow through with your purpose. Be yourself, have fun, and give the kids a chance to have some fun too. Uh, things like Flipgrid are great ways for students to respond with a video in a fun way. Uh, and then how can I extend this learning segment beyond this video? What are you gonna do to take kids and have them desire to continue learning this because of what you did in that video? Um, those are those final thoughts. And please, I really hope you connect with me. Um, if any of you have read either of those books, I hope you drop it in the chat and say hi, I'd love to connect with you there. Um, but now is a chance for us, uh, I guess it's not the only chance, but it's the, the best chance since we can't be within six feet of each other, to connect online and grow together. So uh, let's start those connections now. Absolutely. And I think, you know, during this time, we have really been encouraging students to use the opportunities around them to create videos. And then now we're kind of in a place where, like, yes, students can create videos, but teachers also can create videos. So now we have, you know, like a teacher created video path and a student created video path. And so that's the best way, I think, in my opinion, is to get our students to also create videos in response to our videos as well. So well, I'll pass it back over to Nate now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm going to show you how to, speaking of creating videos, I'm going to show you how to actually create a video if you are uh, inside the video platform. So I'm going to make um, this bigger. Now, you probably have figured out that you'll see myself and Dennis, our screen will be at the bottom left. So I'll make sure and move this around a bit so you'll be able to see kind of all parts of this. So I'm in my dashboard, and when you're in your WeVideo dashboard, you have the option of starting fresh. So I could do just a brand new video. I could do a screen record or even a dual capture where I'm capturing myself and my screen. I can make a, a GIF, or if you say Jeff, I'm still in the GIF camp. So if you want to make a GIF, you can do that, which is just a brand new feature as of the last couple of weeks, which uh, I love because I before had been creating MP4s and having to convert, and now I can do it directly into or directly inside the editor. You can also create a podcast. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about videos, but you know, let's say that you've already created a video and you want to turn it into a podcast. Well, when you export it, and I'll show you here in a bit, you can just export the audio file. Or if you know in the beginning you want to create a podcast, you can just choose podcast. But today I will show you some of the foundations and I wanna start with the template. I think if you're brand new to Weave Video, the easiest way to get started is with a template. So there's a lot of different templates you can choose from. I am gonna go with one of our new templates, the mini lesson, because I think it really is applicable to today. It's gonna to ask you where you want to put the file. I'm gonna put it in my folder called demos for me. So when you're in the editor, here's the general flow. Uh, in the upper left hand corner, you have all of your assets and your inputs here. So your video, your audio, text, transitions, all of those assets come from the upper left hand corner. You'll see here at the bottom, this is where you'll find your timeline. And so you're able to see here, I have some tracks. I know that you're not able to see some of the tracks here at the bottom. Um, I'll again, I'll move some things around here so you'll be able to see it here in a second. But you, right now, you see there's a couple, there's three tracks here you can see. 
This obviously you can tell is an audio track. If you've ever worked with audio tracks, you can see uh, the waves here. Uh, but the, the great part about a template, everything can be moved around and manipulated. So right now, if I press play, it's going to give you a preview of what's currently in the timeline. Okay, so I'll stop it there. All of these things are editable. So if you want to change the music out, then you can do that. You can flip the music out. And let's first just change the title. So let's say I want the actual title to be something, you know, with, well, I'll use the example that didn't escape today. So we're going to say multiply fractions. So save changes. So you've named this lesson multiply fractions. And let's say that, um, let's go down the timeline here. So here's our objectives. Uh, let's say that's fine for now. Well, of course, we're going to want to add. Well, let's just say we want to, because I want to show you how you can add as many bullets as uh, that you want here. So let's just say multiply fractions. So changes. Oh, and you can also man manipulate and move things around here as well. So if you want to you know, make this smaller, make it bigger, you can do that. So let's just changes. Let's say that... This is the part where you'd want to take out the, the template we have here. The instruction is, is the timeline we're on right now. And I want to delete that out. And let's say I want to record myself with doing, you know, obviously working on a problem. So, or talking to my students, whatever you want to do there when you're video. So I would just go to the record button here, press record. And it asks me if I want to do my webcam, my screen, or both. So if you're working with Desmos and you want to record doing, you know, a graphing in Desmos, you can do your screen. Let's just say for now, I just want to speak to my students. So I'll say next. And it's asking me which camera do I want to choose. These look good. My microphone looks good. But if you, can, you have an external microphone, you can do that. I start recording. It gives you a three, two, one. And so you're recording your video. And once you're done with your video, you press stop. And it gives you the chance to look at your video. And if you know you messed up and you're like, I got to do it again, then you can press record again. And that's totally fine. You press save. And what happens when you press save is it puts it in your queue up here. And anything's in your queue, you can move into your timeline. So I'm going to move this down in this track here. Now notice that you have, have two different video tracks here. And so think of these layers as in, the top layer is like you were looking at a bird's eye view down onto the video. So I don't want the think aloud text to be the first one on top there because I could actually move this on top here and I can make my video smaller. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So if I double click on my video, so right now we have think aloud modeling is on top of my, my self teaching. So I'm gonna double click on my video and let's say I wanna make it smaller. I'll do that. I can move this over here. And then that way, save changes. And let's say I want to move this one around too. Down here, save changes. And, and so you're recording your video. And once you're done with your video, so there you go. So you can manipulate your screen, yourself talking. And I love to do this for a screen record. So if I am teaching a lesson and I'm showing uh, you know, the multiplication of fractions. So we're going to go into Dennis's video here in a second. Then I'm able to see my screen, but also see the tool being used, the fractions or whatever I'm manipulating on the screen at the same time. And that definitely helps with the social emotional learning component. Um, let's see. So you can, you can move things in the timeline, wherever you want. Let's say that I want to change out the music. Some of the very bottom here, this is the music. So I'm just going to push the delete button. And I'm going to go up to stock media and um, let's actually put in, let's get audio here. And that's a, that's a fun one. All right, so let's say I like that one. So I'm going to drag this down here. Boom. 
No, you can see, I'll, I'll show you this top one here because it allows you to, you can see that I have um, the menu here called sections. It's, it's my track here. And we were talking earlier about amplifying your sound. So if I just move this bar over, actually you can go up to 500% there on amplification. So again, um, you wanna be careful with that because if you get really, really high, it could start to um, alter some of your voice. So um, just you still wanna make sure you are speaking clearly those, those norms that Dennis talked about are important, but you also have the ability to, and I almost always, when I'm recording myself, because I'm not a loud person, I almost always have to amplify my voice. So let's go back here to this, and the star always means the stock media there. And let's say that I want to bring in some stock media. So let's say, and that's actually a good rule of thumb. If you have, if you are showing something on the screen and, uh, or you're narrating over something and you want to kind of break up the visuals, you can bring some other visuals in. So let's say you're doing a math video and you want to bring a visual of, um, let's say, exploding math equation. That's fun here. Actually, I'm going to move. So what happens is I try to put in a clip that was a little longer than the space I had. Here we go. So there you go. So you can you can put those in as well. And those are fun. I love the stock media, Dennis. This is one where I'm like, you can get stuck forever because I want to find a perfect stock media piece. And we have, we have a million assets, literally a million assets in the stock media. So that's something that I love to play around with and really find the right stock media. I also think that it's important to have some transitions. Again, this is just to clean up your video. So, you know, when you're going from one screen to another screen, you want to have a smooth transition. And so what you can do is I like the crossfade and the crossfade in here. And in that way, whenever you go in from one visual to the next, it fades in nicely and you don't have to have a, a hard cut into the next visual there. Um, let's say that you already have a picture or a graph and you want to narrate over it. Then all you have to do is go to narrate here. You press narrate and it records directly inside the editor. So I'm going to say record. All right, so I'm recording now, and you can see it's also previewing what's where the recording is going at the same time. So you can really voice over and see what you're voicing over. So I'll say stop. I can preview if I want to. I'll say save. And it automatically will add the voiceover down here at the bottom. So the, audio, the music audio track is still there, but I have now my new voiceover. Nate, I want to jump in on that too. That's important yeah. for me because a lot of the times I do have a static math image that I want to show. Not everything I do in class is dynamic, although I try to be dynamic as much as I can. <laughs> so if I have an image that I do want to describe, uh, rather than screencasting a video for a long period of time, I can put that image in here and then narrate over it so that I can re-narrate if I didn't like what I said and not have to re-record video again and again. Um, it makes uh, that option a little bit more available as uh, dual tracks, if you will, the image and the narration, and less of the uh, making sure you get your screencast recording right. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, and there's things you can definitely do. Like once you have your narration, I can press the scissor and I can cut my audio track so or my voiceover. So I find the spot where I pause and let's say I want them to watch something while I'm not talking, I can do that. You can also, you see these dots here, you can place these dots anywhere along the track. And what it allows you to do is control the volume or the fade here. So if I bring this dot all the way down here, the voiceover, and you'll, I'll let you listen to what happens. Where the recording is going at the same time. So you can see how my voice dipped down and then dip back up based on how I structured it here in the, the voiceover track. So that's definitely helpful, especially if you want to uh, have your voice fade out, or again, you can just chop it up and move it, or I can go over here on the side and I can lower my volume all the way down where you're not hearing anything. Okay, so Dennis, I'm gonna take a look at the video project that you made, so uh, don't be nervous. 
Oh, uh, man. Now, awesome. I'll tell everybody now. I put in some video tracks and some components that I love, and then I kind of threw it out to Nate and said, hey, how can you make it yeah. snazzier for me? So let's see. Look at what I did compared to what he said. The first <laughs> time I did this using Wii Video, I threw the videos up in the first section, you know? And now he's yeah. saying, if you drop it down in the second, you can put layers over it. It's a great yeah, plan. And uh, I think that's really powerful. And you can't really see the bottom of the screen too much on this because of our pictures, but it does say uh, like instruction as one of the lessons, as one of the streams there on the left. Yeah. And so that might be, again, where you want to put that instruction piece. So again, I, 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 I manipulate the video so you can see, again, it's kind of small here. I, I will uh, zoom back into it, but you can see how there's multiple tracks here. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so really good. I, I, so your video is fantastic. I'll let the, the audience kind of see what you did here. So we'll just play it in preview mode. <laughs> So now that we've finished talking about multiplying fractions by whole numbers and multiplying fractions by units. So what I would do here, I was going to turn the volume, the music volume a little bit because I want to hear what you're saying. So I can, I'm adjusting the volume. Again, you're not seeing it because my cursor is behind my picture here. So what I would do is I would just pull this volume down where you're actually speaking on the music. And the music. while you're doing that, uh, yeah. what's interesting is that volume is higher than I wanted it to be because I forgot, and I'm learning this, I have a second piece later where that has some a separate music track so i should have put a second audio track for that one so i could control their volumes independently um it's, now when i turned it back up i think it turned up the whole thing yeah no worries yeah well that's that's the beauty of this is we can manipulate the audio and obviously your voice too at the same time so let's see if uh that helped fractions we got one left we'll go a little bit further down multiplying fractions by other fractions that's good there so yeah, I love I love the oh we keep playing here because this is good. You ready? <laughs> See, that's the personal touch. I love that. So I'm gonna fast forward here. Uh, oh yeah, this is the one. Which one doesn't belong? Let's take a look. Oh uh, yeah, this is one you and I talked about before. So um, and you kind of teed me up for this one. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So we were talking, and this is something that Dennis and I did on purpose uh, so we could edit his video real time. So this is one where you have a graphic or even a graphic organizer and or Foursquare, and you're wanting to add some instruction over this. And that's, again, where you would narrate over it. So record. And you always get a nice little countdown here. So I'm giving some instruction there. Now, of course, it's it's progressing through the video there, which is no worries. Because what I can do is just move everything kind of over. So it, cre it automatically created a, a slice right here mm -hmm. uh, at the very bottom. Like it's behind, it basically it's behind your head right now on the screen. Um, but what I can do here is, I'll kind of move it up. I can stretch this out. So this is going to last for a longer time now. Right. And in that way, it'll match up with the voiceover I just did. And of course, we're going to want to move this over where everything's going to need to be moved over. So, right. uh, or actually, what we want to do here is we might want to we want to shorten this and then move it over and then widen this. But anyway, I hope you don't mind messing with your. <laughs> Not at all. I put it in there. But this is it, guys. This is what's great. Um, Nate has been using yeah. this for a while, but I've been using this for just a short period of time and it's just as easy as he's doing. I love the fact that I'm like trimming, extending, uh, moving stuff around really simply. I haven't had an issue with it and I'm not a high quality video editor. It's not like one of those things where you really have to learn uh, terminology and technology like an Adobe or, a, or in that world. So I do like how simple it is. Like he's even showing, it's like, hey, you just extend it, whatever. You might be thinking, oh my gosh, how are you gonna learn how to do that? Um, yeah. you're, you're gonna click on it once and learn how to do it. Absolutely. And what I do is I moved your demonstration down here whenever right. you were doing the problem in Jamboard. And so what if I want to introduce this concept? I can go into, I clicked on text and I love the motion titles. So let's just use the end with the whisper. I can drive this down here. Let's just say I want it to be up there a little longer than that. So let's stretch it over it. So this is going to be go on top of your problem here that you're working out. So of course, just double click on it. And you're able to change the words there. So let's say fractions, say changes, and then the whole number, the quick review, like two thirds. So obviously you can put whatever you want there on top of it. 
and it's in with the whisper, so it'll kind of it'll it'll fade in and fade out. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and it's like uh, there's some transitions already here. This looks great. So whenever you're ready to finish your video, click finish. Hey. Yes. I was gonna say before you jumped back there, um, yeah. just to, to show you guys again what I went through. If you go back to the video sequence, yeah, I guess I guess they can do that. <laughs> Um, you saw I did an intro, a warm-up problem. I did a, a chunk on Jamboard, which is me writing with a black space L -O -N, yeah. and, and, and talking as I write. Yeah. Then the next chunk is me going to Desmos and showing a fraction multiplier tool. Then I went back to Jamboard, but in between those two, I had a brief transition. And then right before my third, um, uh, right, right in between here, this is a scene from Motions 11 where he's sitting there and he goes, you think we need one more? <laughs> yeah, I'll get one more, right? Well, that's because I'm going to do one more example. I'm trying to hook my kids back in for a little bit of fun. I do one more, and then I voice send them out into a Desmos activity for the day. That's what I mean by breaking it up into bite-sized, chewable pieces uh, and connecting them with some new flavors, you know? I love it. Awesome video. Yeah, I love the, uh, the Ocean's Eleven piece there. I think it's fantastic. Well, this is impressive, Dennis. I love it. I know we're... We're almost in the time, so I'll, I'll show you the end part of this of how you actually create a video and send it to your students. So right now I have the the title as Dennis Nathan's Math Mini Lessons. Let's say it's fine for now, but you can name it whatever you want. You can name it maybe the standard that you're teaching or the concept. And then you're going to export as a video and audio only. So if you want to do a podcast, that's where you click audio only. Or the, the newest, latest feature is the GIF, which I love. And so you could even embed it into a Google slide as a GIF if you want. So I like to do HD and then you can choose a thumbnail. After the video is rendered, then you're able to choose whatever thumbnail you want, but you have the choice of you know, the top three at this point. And then you can choose your destination, which is fantastic. So if you wanna go directly to a YouTube channel, you click YouTube. And if you have a Google Drive, you have a class that you have set up in Google Drive already, you can have the video go directly into a folder. And so there's lots of integrations there. Uh, Google Classroom as well, where you can embed this video. And then that way they can see it. And then you click, click the export button and then it goes through the process of rendering and so forth. So oh, awesome job on your video, Dennis. And that yes. was a, kind of a brief overview of the editor. I am going to look at some of the questions here where, uh, oh, it looks like we've had some questions and we've had some answers as well. Um, the, the most voted question was how to get Edpuzzle into the video. And it looks like, yes, Larry has already answered that one, fantastic. You would go into your Edpuzzle and you would just export it. And then uh, same thing with video, you can create a video within we video and then pull it into Edpuzzle. So let's see here. Um, I've been jumping in and trying to answer where I could. Okay, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So looking at like multiple platforms, um, ideas can make the, the transition easier. So, and you talk about like using Desmos, which is fantastic. And then, yeah, the introduction, I think it really depends on, um, the, the content of your lesson and how long your video is already. But I think you're right. Like 10 to 30 seconds is good. Maybe even up to a minute, um, depending on what you, you include in your intro. Sometimes teachers do like a shout out, um, especially if it's a social emotional connection you're making. Um, you might, it might be a little longer, but if it's just a, an instructional lesson about fractions and maybe you are done your SEL connection, then I think you're right. I think your 10, 20 seconds would be fantastic for like a video like you did uh, today. Well, even jumping in on that, if you're gonna do a, a, a shout out or a, or a birthdays of the month kind of list or whatnot, uh, personally, make it a separate video because if you have a good instructional video on multiplying fractions or a literacy standard or something else that everybody's talking about that you need to do your video on, uh, then make that video uh, what we like to call evergreen. Make it yes. something that stays around for a while that you can use and reuse and reuse because it's valid and it's good and not tied to you know Jessica so-and-so's birthday from this month. Um, yes. Separate those and put out an exciting, fun, happy birthday video, different style, different feel, then get your instructional video going. Absolutely, really, really good point there. Um, yeah, looking through here at some of the other questions, um, 
yeah, the copyright regulations, if uh, we did this in the literacy one as well, you, a lot of the publishers had given permissions to use, like if you're reading a book or taking pictures, um, a lot of them have given permission during COVID, but make sure you have read their guidelines under the how to share those. Some of the publishers or companies want you to, you know, uh, if you're going to take a video, then you have a certain amount of time until you take it down. Um, or if you use things in the, in the public domain, you don't have to get permission. You can just automatically use them. And then um, Jason from We Video, thank you, Jason, for jumping in today. And he is exactly right. We have 1 million pieces that are already a part of the platform, so you don't have to worry about any kind of crediting there. All of the royalty free and the copyright uh, has been taken care of there. So um, that's, that's good to know. Yeah, all the webinars we've done this week are on the WeVideo page, the webinar page. So what you will do is go to WeVideo.com and click on education, and you'll be able to see everything that we have done, uh, the recordings, also through Crowdcast, the platform we're using right now. If you go to the WeVideo, follow WeVideo on Crowdcast, you'll be able to see all the recordings as well. A closed captioning is not currently a part of the product, but it is something that the product team is definitely um, considering for the future. So um, yes, it looks like Jason's already answered that. Thank you. And so, Nate, we just talked about yeah. a workaround for that in the chat yeah. where you make a good video and we video, you download it and you're gonna upload it into something like Edpuzzle, upload it to YouTube first, turn the captions on when you set the YouTube video captioning into English or whatever language you want them in. And then when you put that into Edpuzzle, the video will have the captioning feature available. Perfect. I, I love that's again, the beauty of some of these app smashes is you're able to kind of take the best components of other apps and kind of smash them together. So um, thank you for that, for sure. Um, some good examples of math videos. Uh, what are you, some of your go-tos, Dennis? Do you have any that, that I mean, besides yours? Well, honestly, everybody's doing different things. And um, because they all build in their own styles, um, right now, there are like the three act math videos that people are doing that aren't instructional, but it's good video technique for giving things to kids to chew on or think about versus getting out there and doing a quick, you know, tutorial on something else. So um, the examples exist all over YouTube and all over the world. I don't have any one particular place to send you. Uh, we video has some great ideas yeah. of well-structured math videos that you can use and borrow from. Um, and when you find somebody who's uh, teaching in a style that's similar to yours and, and kind of has a way for it that you like what they're doing, um, that you think might engage with your kids, that's what makes a good video style for you. And you, to say what's a good video is like uh, at the beginning of the school year when someone says, hey, what's the new ed tech for this year? It's like, well, uh, if it works for your classroom but not for his, then it's not the new ed tech. It's like you're <laughs> using Desmos, but they're not using it in an English class, but they could be because if you didn't know, you could just use the activity builder for anything. But the, the we all have something where this thing has been good for my class and my room. Yes. Um, and, and so in the same way, a good math instructional video is what puts you at your best ability to pre present the material and puts your students in the most likely opportunity to understand and engage and apply it. So uh, try it out. And honestly, we're all here and you just saw my Twitter and some other people over here in the chat. Um, follow each other, send a video out on Twitter and say, hey, check it out. What do you think of it? We'll tell you what we like and what we don't like if we don't like something. If you want feedback like that, private message you, I promise. But like, if if you want to share those videos with us, follow each other's YouTube channels and see what people are doing. You know, it's a perfect way to do it. Absolutely, really good point. You know, and I wanted to echo the simplicity uh, comments you made. You know, find a platform. You know, of course, we love we video. So I mean, I can do a screencast we video. If you like Jamboard or Desmos, you can record working in those apps. Um, if you have Google Classroom, then use that to you know push the videos into Google Classroom. There's no reason to find all these other platforms unnecessarily because again, there's so many things that are um, chewing up our cognitive energy right now. We want to reduce that effect by providing clarity and simplicity. So uh, really, really great comments you uh, made about simplicity and uh, had to stay in touch with you. So you know, thank you for sharing your, your Twitter info and your books. I hope that everyone's able to, to check out the kind of the great works that you have written. 
Um, I would love to see all of your your videos, even if you're uh, not making a math one or whatever video, a science one, a social studies, whatever content that you teach, or if you're an elementary teacher and you teach uh, your self-contained classroom, you teach everything, um, we want to see your videos. So make sure you at we video or hashtag we video every day or what's your story, because that way we mm -hmm. are able to share. And so we love sharing videos especially ones that you've done for your students or uh, the videos that your students create. We love to share those on social because we want to celebrate all the wonderful work you're doing as teachers, especially during this time of remote learning. So I agree. And I can't, I can't uh, support that enough and say like, I was at a point about 2014 where my educational energy was dwindling and then Twitter and this community of teachers and this online world of saying, we can do better got together. I became a part of it and it reinvigorated such a passion that I just can't, uh, I, I can't be thankful enough to say sharing with you, the teachers who are here uh, is an exciting opportunity for me. And uh, I hope that we can work together. Uh, that's how Nate and I connected and that's how this yeah. whole thing came about. So definitely be a part of uh, the bigger, broader community. I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. And you know, if you want to be a part of a, a community, we have a great one at we video. It's our creators community. Uh, Jeremy love to, to see you there. We have a couple thousand educators there. And last time I checked, it's growing every day. So you can find that by going to education and going to the community site and you click community. You'll just be asked to throw in a couple of uh, contact information items and then you'll be in. And we are already at the, at the end of our webinar. This, yeah. day is, this webinar has flown by. Uh, thanks for keeping it real and fun, Dennis. Um, you're definitely one of the coolest math teachers I've ever uh, had the uh, luxury of uh, getting to work alongside. So thank you and uh, for being on our show today, our webinar, and looking forward to staying connected. And, Absolutely, yeah. And to all of our guests as well, thank you for joining.